No, no jokes about the Toronto Blue Jays. Uh, it's about 5.10 and they tell me uh, in, this, uh, in this country, things start on time. Uh, where I'm from, we usually start about 10 minutes late, so. Uh, but we're going to start on time. It's uh, 5.10 uh, and you're in the uh, analyst, Q&A analyst session. My name is Sean Michael Kerner. Hopefully you're not here to see me. Uh, you're here to see our panelists, but uh, I'm a senior editor at eWeek. I also manage a small site called Linux Today. I've been writing about OpenStack since day one. Um, but that's enough about me. I'm going to have everybody on the panel just introduce themselves, just a quick two-second introduction and tell us what you cover. Uh, and then we'll just jump into, uh, I'll just jump into a bunch of questions from there. The session goes till 5.50 and I will break at 5.30 and then again at 5.40 uh, for questions. So if you have questions, you can hold on to them till then or just uh, use your hand and then there are mics in the middle. So let's start uh, closest to me, uh, Al, if you just introduce yourself. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Al Sadowski. Uh, I'm a research vice president with 451 Research uh, based in New York and I have responsibility for something called Voice of the Service Provider. And I've been covering OpenStax for, I've been to all the uh, OpenStax Summit since the Grizz Grizzly release and even had some experience with it prior to that. Uh, Lauren Nelson from Forrester Research. I'm a principal analyst. I lead up our private cloud coverage. Um, and I've been at the OpenStax Summit since the Essex release. So. Um, Chris Drake uh, with Global Data, principal analyst um, covering um, data center technologies um, worked with a focus on private and hybrid cloud solutions, um, increasingly looking at other things like edge computing and, and blockchain as well. Uh, my first summit was uh, Barcelona, so I think this, that this makes it my, my fifth OpenStack summit um, based in, in London. Um, most of our team members are US based. Um, we used to be called Current Analysis. So still a bit of a, the global data brand was introduced last year. Hi, I'm Gary Chen uh, from IDC. I cover software-defined compute, so I look at things like virtualization, containers, and OpenStack. Um, in terms of OpenStack summits, I don't know what number it is, but my first one was the one in San Francisco, and I don't remember what release, Essex. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's been a long time, and I've been to every one since then. <laughs> And uh, the first the first one I saw you at, Gary, was I think Portland, where we did a panel together that I was at, and then uh, after yeah. that I did a panel, I think, with you, Lauren, in Atlanta, probably. Uh, so we've all done one or two of these things, which is great. Uh, to start, uh, the, the, uh, the only news, the interesting news today was that they're going to rebrand this summit as the Open Infrastructure Summit. So just starting with, with you, Gary, when you think of uh, open infrastructure, is that a, a term or a concept that resonates with you as something that's... Uh, viable and, and legitimate, or is it just uh, window dressing, as it were? Um, I mean, I, th I think the term is fine. I mean, I think, I think it's one of those things that people kind of intuitively understand. Like when you say open infrastructure and you look at all these projects and what's happening in open source, um, I think it's probably harder like to nail it down in terms on paper. Like if you wanted to come up with a requirement, what's, what's open infrastructure? And probably people have maybe slightly different interpretations of it, but, um, you know, as a, I guess as a marketing and branding thing, I think, I think that term works, you know, if you want to turn it into like an IT strategy, I think maybe that's, you know, probably a little bit more vague. Mm. Yeah, I think it, it makes sense that it uh, probably shouldn't have come as too much of a, a surprise and it, uh, it's in line with the, the, the broader focus on um, furthering um, integrations between the, the OpenStack platform and other open source projects, um, the, the focus on on these other projects and um, sitting alongside um, the, the sort of core OpenStack project. So I think yeah, a rebranding move. I think the um, the focus will, or there'll there'll be a need to think about how to how to differentiate and how to um, or, or how to kind of associate the open infrastructure concept with the. The, the wider uh, audience and whether whether the, the aim is to actually reach out to a wider audience. So, you know, there, so, so these are questions that uh, I think need to be asked going forward. Yeah, I think it's a bit of a, a marketing term. Um, in the early days, uh, Richard Stallman used to talk about the free software movement and talk about kind of the purest movement of, of open source and, and what it could be. And open infrastructure is a little bit more of a corporate enterprise phrase where you're talking about principles of leveraging open source software for this freedom of choice, similar to the way you use free, not from a cost perspective, but freedom of speech type 
perspective of how do you have choice? How do you be able to adjust software for your own purposes with also the ability to integrate with what you'd like? Um, and OpenStack for quite some time has been working on how do we play nice with others and get others to believe that we play nice with them. Um, and even since the, the Paris summit, we saw early sessions that were talking about use of containers on OpenStack. Um, and since then, we've seen almost every single summit having more and more sessions about how it integrates with other open source technology. Um, and so I think this is one step further in trying to communicate that OpenStack is, is not just going to be supporting OpenStack projects and ecosystems, but looking at itself in the context of this broader open source world. But I think there's a lot of answers um, are questions to be answered from the OpenStack group of what does this mean for an enterprise audience, um, for those that already use OpenStack today, and also to try and make it more applicable to be the de facto approach to private cloud for enterprises. Because today I think it's a pretty small group of organizations that consider and, and have that approach and following of, of how they target private cloud issues. Yeah, I, not to, uh, I, just to add to it, I would say it was probably a necessary move for the OpenStack Foundation to be something more than just OpenStack because OpenStack was compute and storage and networking and a couple uh, ancillary things. And in order to stay relevant in machine learning and uh, edge computing and others, they needed to brand themselves something bigger than just OpenStack. So open infrastructure and to you know, what Lauren was saying about playing nice in the with Kubernetes and with other technologies, uh, it shows a uh, you know an embrace of other open source communities. Yeah, I mean one uh, sorry, I mean one one thing is you know I mean I think open infrastructure is great and working with other open source projects, but I mean one point <coughs> is like should that be a limiting factor? I mean what if something isn't open source and but customers are using it? You know it could be a public cloud, it could be other technology. In the in the real world, people use things that aren't open, so. Should that, you know, should that stop OpenStack from reaching out and doing more with you know, some of those other things that, that might not be open? Mm. Yeah, that's an actually an interesting conversation because the Open Infrastructure Summit, uh, and I know, Lauren, you mentioned uh, Richard Stallman, RMS, who uh, believes in this as a religion. Um, there's no word open source in there. There's no uh, defining boundaries other than the word open. Um, and I don't think calling the summit the closed infrastructure summit would have worked very well. Uh, for those of you that might be uh, thinking about the AWS reInvent in two weeks, I don't know if we should call that the, uh, the closed infrastructure summit, but we'll leave that, uh, leave that alone. Um, and then just going uh, the other way, and, and, uh, in terms of direction for OpenStack, because I know uh, everyone here has mentioned that there's things that needed to change. Um, what are your general views, I'll start with you, Al, on the uh, current state of OpenStack, whether you see it growing, declining, or otherwise, and I know, you know all, all of your various analyst firms, uh, you do different types of market sizing, but what's the general direction that you see at this point in 2018? Yeah, so it's something I could, I could give you a, a, a number around. Uh, we do something called the OpenStack Market Monitor, so we have you know, bottoms-up estimates from a number of uh, folks that either are a distributor, somebody doing private cloud, public cloud, and uh, we expect all of those combined to be about a, a $5 billion industry by 2020. Um, but if you look at the growth rate, the growth rate, you know, each individual one may have different, but in aggregate, it's about 24% growth rate through 2022. Um, but if you think about it, that growth rate is roughly about half of what AWS's growth rate is on its own. So even if it grows at the expected rate, it's still growing a lot slower than AWS. Uh, uh, but at this point, I don't think anybody expects OpenStack to be a world beater uh, compared to some of the hyperscalers. Uh, it has, a, has its role and it's, and it's growing. Yeah, what are you seeing, Lauren? Or yeah, so <coughs> the OpenStack user survey just came out. Um, and one of the things that, that came out was that 48% of those that took the open source user survey were, or using open, OpenStack are uh, in APAC. And I think 24%, 25% in Europe, 24% in the US. Um, so roughly you're looking at one fourth, one fourth, and one half. Um, so if you want to answer the question of do most enterprises today in North America and Europe have private clouds based on OpenStack, the answer is no. Um, does that mean it's not legitimate? Does that mean it's not growing? No. 
Um, a lot of organizations, they've started to look at their private cloud strategy as, as one of three things. Either we're going to make it really easy, do converged, hyper-converged, and try and focus on what sits above that, do total replacement. Uh, those looking at classic journey to cloud, but semi more developer focused, generally on a VMware based private cloud, and those looking at open source, cost affordable private cloud at scale, where their biggest cost is not technical skill uh, or cost of change in their organization, their biggest cost is software licensing and looking at solutions that help them fulfill that. So I, I think it's a, a kind of a tough question to say, is it growing? Is it doing successful? I think it's doing really successfully in certain audiences, certain verticals, um, and among those with high technical acumen. And I think it's struggling at having applicability in enterprises where that's not the case. No, I, I agree with you, and I'll just say one word. Is in the beginning, I thought, probably like others, that the Rackspace public cloud would be a challenger. Um, and apologies to anyone that works for Rackspace in the audience. That didn't quite work. Um, what's your views, Gus? Um, <coughs> it's interesting, the um, weeks leading up to this summit, um, there were a number of people um, asked me the question, you know, has, well, hasn't, you're going to the OpenStack summit, hasn't OpenStack um, run out of steam? Um, and you know, these were analysts that, that don't come along to the summit, so they're maybe not so familiar with the, the, the way that the focus has evolved. Um, but I mean, I responded by saying that it does depend on who you ask, and um, I think it is important to consider the sort of geographical differences, as, as Lauren's already pointed out. Um, but also, um, if you speak to vendors, um, there does seem to be a sort of backpedaling um, in terms of, among some vendors who are putting less emphasis. They have an OpenStack offering, an OpenStack distribution still, but their their focus is on, and their priority is on other. Uh, cloud solutions and um, you know it, it may be that um, following the the early hype that um, gets discussed with reference to OpenStack we've seen a bit of a, a rationalization within the industry and um, the emergence of um, a much smaller number of, of strong um, players in, in this this sector and you know they are uh, it, it, they will t tell you that they're they're seeing growth, and in terms of actual customer numbers, um, I, you know, I, I, I agree that that it was probably more like a slow uh, and steady increase. Um, I think, though, we can, you know, if you're talking about growth, you can. Um, there are different different ways of looking at growth, and I think that um, beyond um, actual customer numbers. And even beyond looking at the, the attendees at a, a summit like this, um, you know, we're seeing, you, know, you can define growth in terms of um, the, the expansion of existing um, OpenStack footprints. I mean, this morning, um, uh, some of the, uh, the speakers uh, from uh, Deutsche Telekom and um, OVH talked about how they're expanding their existing, their existing footprints. And also um, a, 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 how the way in which in existing users are engaging with, with more um, OpenStack projects. So there's a sort of deep, deepening of, of engagement amongst, amongst existing um, customers. Um, so different ways of understanding um, growth. Um, I think you know. I think it's probably fair to say that you know, OpenStack is in a, a state of, of, of transition. Um, you know, it's coming out of that sort of uh, earlier hype cycle, and um, so starting starting to move towards uh, its sort of uh, future model, which um, you know we're, we're we're here to discuss at the moment. This this event. Yeah, I mean, I've seen the same thing. I mean, it's varied, right? I mean, certainly, I think overall, yes, the growth rate has slowed. Not to say OpenStack still isn't growing, but <clears throat> I think where we, I mean, where we've seen the biggest declines in our research is really in the uh, enterprise private cloud. Um, I think the, the pipeline we've seen that noticeably shrink um, over the past uh, year or two. Um, but you know, it's still it's still doing really well in, in areas like telco and NFV. Um, and uh, you know the U.S. is probably right now the, the worst market for OpenStack. Uh, I think China's doing, China's probably the fastest growth right now for, for OpenStack, and then um, and Europe is doing okay. But um, I think going forward, I mean, I think there's a, you know there's a bunch of things that kind of um, you know kind of change the trajectory of OpenStack. I mean, one is sort of 
where cloud is today, where we have the top three providers and everyone else, and that gap is growing bigger, and the top three is not using OpenStack. And the second is really containers, where a lot of the Kubernetes took away a lot of the orchestration value. And you know, OpenStack could still be great for containers, right? But it's, I think it's a different story. It's, it's probably a harder story to tell why you know, OpenStack is a great infrastructure for containers. Um, so I think that's sort of kind of the headwinds that we've seen OpenStack kind of fighting against at the moment. That's interesting. Uh, and Gary, you just mentioned that you're seeing declines in enterprise private cloud. And just a question for everybody. We'll start with you, Gary. Um, what is the demand for enterprise private cloud? There are some vendors that will tell me uh, private cloud is really just a euphemism for VMware, uh, and then everybody just bursts out to uh, one of the three big providers, and that's it. Or is there really still a use case among you know, uh, uh, Fortune 500 or Fortune 1000 enterprises for private cloud, whether it's OpenStack or otherwise? Yeah. I mean, I think private cloud is one of those things, especially for an analyst, right, when you get starting into taxonomies, right? What do you, how do you define a private cloud, right? Because a lot of customers define private cloud as some installation of VMware of varying, you know, sophistications, and, and people probably have different, um, you know, definitions of that. And maybe at the end of it, it doesn't really matter, right? I mean, if they, if they say it's a cloud, it fulfills whatever need that they have for, you know, getting things done quickly, okay, you know, it's maybe a private cloud for them. But, um, you know, I mean, I think the market is still good for private cloud in concept and the people still have on-premises and they're certainly modernizing that. Um, I think it looks a lot different now. People are starting to think of, you know, Kubernetes and containers as, you know, what their private cloud might look like and what's underneath that may not be OpenStack, right? So, I mean, I think that's sort of the difficult thing is, you know, I think a lot of what's, um, you know, I guess default in containers is, you know, hey, it runs on any infrastructure, right? So um, it can run on sophisticated infrastructure and not so sophisticated infrastructure. It can run on, you know, just basically raw virtualization. So, you know, I think um, that makes people think, you know, can I, if, you know, the, they, the reality is they have VMware, do I just keep that and just put containers on top of that? You know, what motivation would I have to move to OpenStack if I want to do containers? You know, it might be better. Is it that much better? Uh, you know, versus the amount of work that, and effort I had to put in that. So, um, yeah. So I think private cloud is still a market, but I think it's it's rapidly changing of what the requirements for that cloud is, and it's not uh, so much VM based anymore. Great. Uh, are you seeing similar things on, on your uh, analyst group, uh, Chris? Yeah. I mean, I think there. You know, we're. Um, yeah, I think with the, I think there's, well, there's a lot of focus on the move towards hybrid cloud adoption. I think that that implies um, the uh, the existence of a, a private cloud in some <coughs> shape or form, um, and I think there are different. Um, you know, there was a while where analysts were predicting the sort of steady decline of, uh, of private clouds, uh, and um, you know this sort of. A dramatic shift towards the, the use of public cloud services. I think that's that's um, certainly lev leveled off. And again, it depends on on you know particular regions, their regional dynamics. And I think there are um, there are reasons why um, some enterprises uh, need to to keep um, workloads within a private cloud environment. It doesn't necessarily have to be an on-prem environment, but there are you know there are compliance pressures, there are security reasons, there are um, performance reasons um, uh, that um, require uh, enterprises to continue maintaining a, a private cloud. I think that um, the, the attention that um, the private cloud solutions um, is getting from the big public cloud providers shows that they also recognize that there's not going to be you know, it's not all going to be uh, a, a, a shift to to the public cloud. I mean, uh, with AWS, Microsoft, um, I, IBM, Google, Oracle, they're, they we're seeing this. This um, we've seen this. Um, you know, you know, very interesting. And just in the last few months, it seems every every other day there there is a, a, a new. Um, hybrid cloud um, announcement uh, emerging. Um, there's one with uh, Cisco um, yesterday, and um, I, I believe it was Cisco AWS. Um, so, so yeah, I think this that that is also showing that that recognition that um, hybrid cloud, private cloud isn't going to uh, disappear, but. Um, 
uh, you know, th there are many different uh, forms of, of private cloud, clearly. Yeah, I completely agree. And I'll just say that, you know, talking about taxonomies, uh, the uh, AWS, Kubernetes, Cisco thing, mm -hmm. they're now calling that multi-cloud. Uh, VMware used to call it vCloud Air or hybrid. They're, mm -hmm. They got rid of the word hybrid. Now they just use multi-cloud instead, but it keeps changing. Um, what are you saying, Lauren? Uh, I hate both of those terms. Um, <laughs> I recently did a report talking about how they're both equally useless terms. Uh, NIST actually defines hybrid as being able to burst from one in cloud environment to the other. It's, it's actually one of the only NIST definitions that we don't follow. Um, if, and anytime somebody says that they're the leader in hybrid cloud, I roll my eyes quite a bit. Um, a lot of companies, when they think about cloud, they're starting to come down off of the hype cycles and away from the shiny objects and thinking about what is the context of my organization? Do I need to look at the investments I have? Is there a certain moment in time when I have a moment of change where I need to do something radically differently? Whether that's a refresh cycle, whether that's executive change, whether that's some sort of time or period when the economics drastically change or in favor of you doing something radically different. And that's when we've seen the more aggressive shifts towards public cloud. Um, some industries feel that pressure more than others. Some companies feel that pressure more than others. Um, and there's certainly applications migrating to the cloud. But for a lot of companies, the pace of change is not tolerable to do something so quickly. Um, and oftentimes when they are migrating or outsourcing drastically, they're looking at the, something more similar to their internal environment. They're looking at a VMware-based hosted private <coughs> cloud environment in the interim. Um, they're trying to shut down their data center before they actually think about true transformation. Um, migrating an app from an on-prem environment to a public cloud is not easy. I think we all know, know the challenges there in terms of arch architectural changes and looking at an app that's built to, to vertically scale in a horizontally scaling environment. Um, but I think when we think about private cloud as a context, I, I agree with, with Gary on the, the fact that that line is shifting. People care less about whether it's technically a private cloud or not. I think the question of is, is if that's good enough for that organization, what's the rate of maturity needed for their end goal? Um, and for some, that's a small environment within their data center that's called the private cloud. For others, it's about slow maturity of that internal environment. Um, I think a lot of companies are starting to come back off of that and realizing they've over-invested um, in some cases in private cloud on trying to mature it faster than it needs to or that their uh, people or process was able to handle. Um, and organizations that are going most aggressively at private cloud are those that actually should be building a private cloud and want to be in the data center business. Um, and they've been making the most strides in this space because they realize it's a fundamental change for them at their modern business, at, at digitally transforming that data center faster. For a lot of organizations, that's not the goal. It's about getting their people moving faster. It's about not changing too many things at once. It's about just trying to to get some result at the end of the day, rather than biting off too much so that they can chew. Yeah, I, I would uh, just to add is the one company that's not talking about hybrid cloud or or multi-cloud is AWS, and that's because they expect all the workloads to end up there. So the ones that are talking about hybrid and multi are the ones that are trying to at least get a piece of that business. So uh, something's going to be rooted on-prem or in a hosted environment and leverage AWS. Even Microsoft, you know, their answer is, you know, they're on-premise Azure with their public Azure. So I think most people that are talking about hybrid is they're trying to win some of that business that may be going to uh, one, one, of the, one of the hyperscalers. And, you know, fun fact, if AWS continues to grow at the rate it's growing, it's going to be bigger in terms of revenue than Amazon.com as far as the, uh, the company is concerned over the next 10 years. But I think the, the, the research that we do with our Voice of the Enterprise um, actually shows like that road to hybrid is actually private, meaning that a their hybrid scenario requires some sort of private deployment that leverages the public cloud for, for either a piece of the uh, application functionality or you know to do bursting or, or things like that. But there's that hybrid component is going to be private, and we expect private cloud uh, uh, to, to grow, especially within that OpenStack market monitor, the service providers, the distros, the public, uh, the private part is growing a lot faster than the, than the public part for sure. Yeah. Don't disagree. Uh, though expect at AWS uh, reinvent in two weeks some interesting 
private, hybrid, multi-cloud, news, whatever we want to call it. Because uh, There's entire always coming. industries that are holding their breath, yeah. waiting to find <laughs> out if they're going to be displaced by a AWS reInvent. And they'll, they'll find out you know, at the 10-minute mark in Werner's keynote, and then again at the 16-minute mark when he says something different, and that's how it goes. Um, just a quick time check. It's 5.35. We've got about 15 minutes left. Um, if anybody wanted to ask a, a question, we've got mics on the side. Otherwise, I've got a few more. We've got one question. Hooray. Uh, we've got two questions. That's great. Uh, just on my right and then the left first. Go ahead, sir. Good. Yeah, it's on. Sh should be on. Thank you very much for the sessions. And uh, finally, you touched uh, the hybrid cloud side. Uh, actually, customers, uh, private, uh, who is looking for private cloud solution these days, uh, they embrace with uh, Microsoft technology like Azure Stack. Uh, the simple reason is that uh, they wanted to have a seamless data flow, uh, which is which needed to be or which needed to be powered after a uh, couple of years. Like when they think about having their uh, data moving into into public cloud uh, for DR as a service or backup as a service. So uh, the implementation of private cloud in uh, Microsoft Azure, for example. This is uh, getting more and more popular because of the support uh, capabilities and all that. So whether this one will be a threat for uh, OpenStack-based uh, private clouds? So the question is if, if, if any of the panelists here think... Uh, I think the gentleman on the right side, uh, you already... Yes. You already talked about this, right? The hybrid cloud, like Microsoft yeah. Azure and all that. So maybe you are the right person to do that. Like, I mean, it's a, see, I'm coming from a career background, a principal vendor. So uh, the second question will be, uh, this, I mean, I will put the second question later. Yeah, I, yeah, I think a, a simple answer is yes, OpenStack is a competitor to Microsoft's Azure and uh, Azure Stack for sure. Um, it, if, you, if you look at service providers that are partnering for hybrid cloud scenarios, there's a lot more that are partnering with Microsoft and AWS and Google and even Oracle. Uh, they're not partnering nearly as probably by, by by large percentages, they're not partnering with OpenStack-based public cloud providers. Uh, but you know, OpenStack, you know, ha has a role, um, it, it's, and it's mainly used for for private cloud. But for for hybrid, it has a, a a piece. But it's going to partner with the hyperscalers for the most part, which are not OpenStack-based. So, yeah, I mean, so, uh, so in the morning, uh, in the keynote uh, presentation, I don't remember who uh, showed that uh, that slide, uh, talking about 75 data centers, uh, I mean, uh, not cloud. data centers, 75 public clouds based on OpenStack. So if a customer is going for a private cloud solution based on OpenStack, uh, will they be able to move their data, like non-critical data for backup as a service or uh, or uh, DRS a service to any of these kind of public clouds which is built on OpenStack because OpenStack is very powerful in public, private, and hybrid. Plus, it can be in virtual environment, it can be in, uh, in uh, physical environment, and in container and environment. So the power is there. So uh, can it offer today the same thing what Microsoft is targeting? Uh, except this, uh, the support services. Yeah, that, that 75 number, it was 75, I believe it was 75 data centers that are, are no, so, bind across all the public cloud providers. So, yeah, 75 public data centers. And I think a third of them were yeah. maybe OVH. Um, I think the answer technically is yes, but whether all of those public cloud providers are configured the same way is, is a different question, um, yeah. where there's only one AWS, but not all. OpenStack public clouds are built the same way, but you know, I'll let others. Uh, yeah. You know, yeah, I'll just chime in on that just for a quarter second. Uh, there's something called the, the OpenStack Federation where you do it through Keystone, and if they have uh, the same uh, directory layer, then you can federate. Um, yeah, go ahead, Lauren, and then if we get the second question after, and thank you for your question, sir. Yeah, I, I was just going to add one question. little tiny bit on that. So, um, 
you're specifically asking about the DR and backup scenario for this. And I think Not Microsoft... Not only that. That is only uh, mm -hmm. one of the things. Because, see, uh, I will make it generalized. It is called uh, seamless data flow from private cl cloud to public cloud. Yep, so it's what you're talking not about not only is the backup, first uh, thing. Or it's not only DR. Mm -hmm. So what you're talking about is like the, the original pitch of OpenStack was that it would be able to do this, that it would be able to have consistency for public and private and give you the seamless flow between those two worlds. Um, and vendors that meet and have certified against core projects, you would theoretically be able to do that. Um, and for the most part, that's done on the infrastructure perspective today and not on the data side of portability for those applications. Now, can you do it for a use case like DR and backup? That is something that's probably very, very achievable. When you look at something like Microsoft Azure Stack, that is typically, well, from everything I've heard, is incredibly expensive stack that is very difficult to do unless there's a very specific region why you need capacity at the edge. And so, although it's a popular scenario, very rarely is it used for something like DR or backup. But, I, I mean, I, I, there's a kind of drawing line. Theoretically, yes. Yeah, you, you said the right thing, but still customers are going for that. Like, 43 VMs required for a private cloud scenario uh, in uh, Microsoft Azure, but still, Customer is going for that. That that is the point. Anyway, I'll come to the second yeah, question. Thank you. you. Um, you've had the mic for a little while. We appreciate your, your time. But if we could move on to the next question, and then we'll thank come you. back, Jeff, after, just so that everyone get the chance to ask. But thank you. Go ahead, sir. Thank you. Yeah. Um, with the recent acquisition, um, IBM have made for Red Hat, and of course the interest in OpenShift. What are your thoughts regarding this um, this move that has been made? Uh, for IBM to become, yeah, uh, more in the mix, should we say, with Blue Mix? That's a great question, and thank you for asking. That would have been my last question, so you saved that from me. Go ahead. Uh, and, and my only comment on that is uh, six months ago, IBM kind of moved away from OpenStack. So IBM Cloud Private is not OpenStack at all, but I'll, I'll let uh, all the analysts chime in. Thank you. I want to start? I'll, I, I'm sure we all have a comment, but I'll let somebody else start. Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, IBM and Red Hat, I mean, they're, they're, I mean, Red Hat was really known for being open source, right? I mean, IBM probably didn't get a lot of credit for some of the open source things uh, that it does a lot of customers, I think, don't know that side of IBM. But, um, I mean, they're two of the largest contributors to open source, you know, including OpenStack. So I think however that um, deal works out, it's going to have a big impact on, the, you know, on open source in general. Um, so, you know, I think it's early to tell, but, uh, you know, I mean, I think IBM's aware of some of the issues with Red Hat and how, it, you know, things it needs to do to keep that momentum going in terms of keeping it separate and, you know, independent and things like that. Um, you know, I think, uh, you know, whether IBM will really pump, you know, more energy into Red Hat's OpenStack business is, you know, to be determined. I mean, they made a go of it and, you know, they, they pulled out of that market. Um, you know, it, you know, underneath things like OpenShift or underneath Cloud Foundry, you know, it, it, it could play a role. I, I don't think it'll play a kind of front and center role. I think it'll play a supporting role. They'll use it where it makes sense. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think less and less, you know, kind of OpenStack is kind of like a standalone product. It, I think a lot of it's moving to these container or dev PaaS type platforms and OpenStack will be something that's dragged along with it. So, you know, I don't think it won't, you know, won't be a valuable asset. I don't know if it'll be like, you know, something they're gonna lead with. Yeah, I think IBM's statement at the moment is they're gonna be very hands-off mm. with, right. with Red Hat. They, they, they yeah. actually, that actually is the case. <laughs> Red Hat actually had an analyst day uh, this past Thursday. Gary and I uh, were, were both there. Were you there too, Chris? I was at one in London. You were actually. at the one in London. Um, and they, they, were, they were basically said, we're going to remain a you know, wholly owned subsidiary and continue down our path. And uh, you know, they're going to, for now, uh, you know, operate as usual. Uh, I don't think IBM bought Red Hat for its products or its IP because it's built on open source yeah. software. It bought a culture. Um, it didn't buy um, customers because IBM's strategic accounts are like, they think they said like 2,000 strategic accounts and Red Hat's strategic accounts was like 40. So uh, I think there's a, an opportunity to get Red Hat more embedded with IBM customers was a, was a big part of it. 
Yes, yeah, the one thing that they're remaining um, tight-lipped about at all of these events, including today and the analyst events that they, they, they've had in the last couple of weeks, that um, you know, they're, they're more interested to hear what, what we think about it rather than actually give away um, anything about um, you know, what, what it might mean. Um, you know, they have um, said that they, they aim to, to safeguard and preserve um, Red Hat's independence, but what, what does that mean? It, it almost, to, 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 um, to not look for ways of, of leveraging um, the Agreed. new relationship, leveraging um, product synergies, it would then, you know, it raises questions about why they've acquired Red Hat um, in the first place. So, um, you know, I, I, maybe, maybe there are, um, you know, lessons to be learned from um, Dell EMC VMware, where um, you know VMware's independence has been preserved, but there have been definite moves to to, to leverage um, uh, synergies, and you know that for now, um, uh, Dell EMC remains committed to um, uh, some competing offerings. But will that you know will that happen over will that continue over the long term? Um, not so sure, um, but. Um, yeah, I mean, um, IBM, obviously, uh, questions about IBM, they, they frame the announcement in terms of um, hybrid cloud, and th this is going to position um, IBM as the, you know, the leading number one hybrid cloud provider. Um, not quite sure why they chose to, to use that, that language when you know, Red Hat is, I, I guess, with op OpenShift is growing, certainly, but they're, they're, they're more commonly associated with their, their strengths in, in, in private cloud. So, um, um, but definitely, you know, there are there are overlaps as well, which will need to be addressed. Um, and again, it would um, wouldn't make sense to um, continue having those. Yeah. Great. Um, go ahead, Lauren. And then we got five minutes left, and then we got one last question after. Sure. So um, a couple quick things. So one, um, yes, they won't talk about it yet. We won't know anything for a year. Um, some fun things that I like to think about. I, I love doing the Dell EMC analogy um, in terms of keeping it as a separate entity. It brings a big question for large technical tech companies that have kind of are past their time in terms of brand sexiness um, to see what do they do to try and get the, win that peel back. And IBM, for a long time, has had an acquisition strategy where they will acquire hot new companies and then integrate them. Um, and that has not been particularly successful. Um, and so, you know, what, does, what do they have to do to make it successful? Well, truly keep it separate and really mean it. Um, a lot of Red Hat, Red Hat folks are former IBMers that had left IBM because they felt it wasn't a place they could really innovate. So how do you keep that culture? How do you preserve that brand? Um, IBM plays in a ton of different markets. I think Forrester has scored them the last two years in over a hundred evaluations, and they only overlap with Red Hat in five. Hmm. So there's not a ton of over overlapping products. Um, there are certainly some. And interestingly enough, uh, when you look at how they fared in our evaluations versus Red Hat, IBM actually did better in the actual product evaluation. So I, I couldn't agree more that it's not product, Adoption, it's the brand association, the culture, and the uh, ability to monetize the open source world, where they think it's going to be core for success in the private cloud side. And Great. the engineers, too. Um, yeah. Go ahead, sir, and you've got 30 seconds to ask your question, so uh, lightning round. I'll, I'll be playing a little bit of devil advocate here. Uh, both vendors and customers are looking at the analysts to provide the recommendation, you know, where they should invest their money, where they should focus their product development. And my question to you is, what would be the message to this audience why open infrastructure matters. And the reason I'm asking it is uh, if you look at what you said about the market, correct? you say the growth is slowing down in the, let's say the open stack and so on, you, the ecosystem looks very different. The public uh, cloud gorillas are fighting each other. Uh, you know, vendors like VMware and Microsoft are fighting for uh, legitimacy in the private cloud. And that all benefits the enterprise users uh, because you know, they, they can play them against the other, they have lots of options. So I would you say to this user that uh, both to the, to the vendors, such as hardware vendors and infrastructure vendors, it makes sense to invest in product development in open infrastructure. I would you say the enterprise users or user who purchase uh, these services, why would it matter to uh, purchase open infrastructure solutions? 
Thank you, sir. That's a great closing question. Um, so just as a, as a closing remarks, if everyone could just give uh, a minute or so, uh, which I know is tough, uh, just, just in response, why open infrastructure matters? As per the question, go ahead. We'll start with Al. Okay. Um, I think it matters to any enterprise or any vendor that's looking to monetize everything that's not going to a proprietary platform. Uh, and I think what they need to do is work together because uh, I think a lot of right now what's happening within the open source community is, yeah, they, they have these various communities, but when it comes down to the, the hardware vendors, they're all competitors. You know, we wrote a report about the, you know, the tragedy of the commons versus the cornucopia of the commons in a, as it applies to open source. And if you don't all work together, you know, that commons is going to, to fail. So I think they all need to figure out how to uh, work together, and that's what uh, the open... Stack Foundation and, 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 and others that have these open source communities and coming together as something called open infrastructure uh, need to do, but they, they, uh, they currently are all for-profit businesses that you know, at the end of the day are, are competitors as well, so it's a, it's a tough road to hoe to continue that commons theme there. Um, I don't know what advice I'd particularly give. Uh, for a lot of folks, open infrastructure is very hard. Uh, for those doing open infrastructure to its extremes, they're trying to reduce software licensing costs. Um, that's part of the initiative. And so for a lot of vendors playing in this space, it's a tough market to be in because they're gonna expect very scalable costs or costs for licenses that scale. And so it makes it very difficult for them to, to make less profit at the expense of the overall standard being successful. Uh, it also makes it difficult when large hyperscalers like Google is donating Kubernetes and TensorFlow to try and establish standards on the private cloud side and, and trying to figure out how do you still try and monetize or look at brand and open source compared to solutions like that. So I think it's a challenge. I think the next big foray that folks are looking at is, is the services space. How do you have services that work cross solutions that actually allow you to have flexibility and choice about deployment model for when it makes sense to move? Um, kind of the repatriation for very specific applications when the economics change. Um, how, do you, how do you give that type of flexibility in a way that's not too time intensive um, or cost intensive? So I'd, I'd say oy, monetization is changing and, and prepare. You know, I think the, um, you know, the attractions of, of um, open source technologies, open stack and, and, and open source, um, they, you know, they still remain the sort of flexibility that it offers users to, to develop um, new services, the, the, the ability to avoid uh, vendor lock-in. And um, you know, I think that's you know, one reason why um, some users will continue to be wary of the, the Azure stacks, for example. Um, the cost savings as well, um, and the opportunities that it offers to, to actually participate in um, a community um, forums to help um, shape the evolution of the, the technology as well. Um, and there's certainly, um, uh, having said that, the, ch the challenges, the, 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 the issues associated with, with open source, the, the complexity and the perceived complexity. Um, and um, I think that you know, going forward, I think the sort of the main focus, um, one of the main focus areas does need to be on, on integration and, and um, uh, you know, promoting better, better integration between different open source technologies. Great. And we're, we're at the end of time, but uh, go ahead, Gary, and we'll... Yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, I mean, I think at the end of the day, um, you know, customers spend money on solutions. Um, and, you know, I think all things being equal, I mean, open infrastructure is great, uh, you know, if it's got cost uh, or lock-in benefits, but it's also not really, uh, black and white either, right? It's open or non, I mean, there's a lot of things that are sort of in the middle and it really depends on how you, you know, who brings it to market and what form. So there's things that have bits of proprietary code, you need to really make it run well. Um, there's different models of, you know, open source and you can build a really closed, locked in service based on open source, but you know, as a cloud service, it's, um, you know, it doesn't really matter what it uses. So. Um, you know, I, I think at the end of the day right now, what we're seeing is a lot of, inno a lot of the innovation and things like cloud and containers are coming from open source. Um, and so I think people are really coming because of that cutting edge technology. Um, they're consuming it in different ways. 
um, and some of it is you know more open and flexible and portable and, uh, than others. Um, but um, I think that's probably that's the attraction is right now that the uh, open source is really taking a leadership position in, in new innovation. Where I, I think in the past they were more kind of like let's make an open version of something that already existed, and now they're really kind of um, you know, creating new technology. Great, I completely agree. Um, thanks everyone for coming to, uh, to our session today. We're at the end of time. And if you could all uh, help me to thank our panelists, uh, appreciate it. And thanks again.